Good evening. Uh, there, we've really got a packed house today, which is wonderful. I just um, want to point out there are a few seats up front and, uh, and up front over here and a couple seats, it looks like, um, over there. Um, my name is Mark Leff, and I'm chair of the George A. Miller Committee, which through the Center for Advanced Study is responsible for the university's MillerCom lecture series. Uh, today's lecture, as we'll hear soon, is part of a number uh, of, uh, plays a number of roles on campus, but it's the second in what promises to be a wide-ranging interdisciplinary series uh, of Miller-Com lectures that will encompass psychology, uh, medicine, animal rights, genetics, uh, post-colonialism uh, and the scientific revolution. Uh, the next miller Com lecture comes pretty much on the heels uh, of this one on uh, Thursday, September 14th, 7.30 in Lincoln Hall Theater. We have one aspect, perhaps, or one thing that connects with today's uh, uh, lecture, and this one's uh, dealing in part with uh, issues of the mind. It's uh, noted author Douglas Hofstadter uh, on how various forms of analogy uh, shape our thoughts. Uh, then the next lecture won't be next Millercom lecture uh, in particular, uh, will be in early October, Thursday, October 5th at um, 4 p.m. Um, this uh, deals with the, in some ways, the health part of uh, today's, uh, and the medicine part of today's lecture. Uh, Mark Siegler uh, will be lecturing on bioethical challenges in a 21st century world, a world in which inequities in global health care uh, are only widening. And that will be at the ballroom of the Alice uh, Campbell Alumni Center, again on Thursday, October 5th at 4 p.m. Uh, the Millercom series is named after George A. Miller, uh, a distinguished mathematician who taught at the University of Illinois from 1906 to 1931. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, uh, also uh, a member of a number of prestigious mathematical societies around the world. Uh, his research specialty was the theory of finite groups. He published hundreds of papers on that. He was also keenly interested in the history of mathematics. That said, as far as his colleagues could tell, he wasn't interested in much else. Uh, he thought sports and music were a waste of time. Uh, for 20 years after he officially retired, what he spent his life doing was going to the office virtually every day, uh, except on Christmas when his wife insisted that he stay at home. Uh, he, when he was at, when he stayed at his office, a, a kind of fire trap office in, uh, in Altgeld Hall, uh, he would uh, line up two chairs together, uh, put, put his, uh, uh, use his uh, mathematical journals for padding and sleep across the, uh, the uh, two chairs. He lived so modestly that when he died in 1951, his colleagues, fearing that he was uh, penniless, and watching him as he, as he uh, shuffled uh, from uh, the few blocks from his office to Altgeld Hall, uh, they figured he was penniless. I mean, there he was with his overshoes that were, that were flapping, and, uh, and they collected money for his funeral. Um, as it turns out, he didn't need it. Uh, the whole com uh, community was shocked to discover that George A. Miller had left an estate valued at nearly one million dollars. Somehow, no one can figure out how, really collected from his salary and his pension at the University of Illinois. There's a kind of, there's a kind of irony here in that, uh, that this man, uh, who was known in his uh, lifetime for a relatively uh, narrow academic focus, for in many ways walling himself off from some of the very environmental factors that we're going to hear about today. Uh, 
uh, is, uh, is the one who, is, who bequeathed the money uh, that allows the campus community to do what a university is supposed to do, to broaden our range of intellectual inquiry, to impel us to comprehend the world outside. Um, it's now uh, my pleasure uh, to, uh, to introduce uh, the, uh, uh, the, chair, the head of the uh, Department of Psychology, Professor Dave uh, Irwin, who will begin to introduce tonight's event. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, on behalf of the Department of Psychology, it gives me great pleasure to open the 18th annual Lanier Lecture, which is part of the uh, MillerCom series, offered this year by Professor Avshalom Caspi. Before I yield the microphone, I'd like to say a few words about Professor Lyle Lanier, uh, in whose honor we hold this uh, lecture series. Most of us never had the privilege of meeting Lyle Lanier. He left Illinois in 1972 and died in 1988, years before most of us joined the psychology department. So the name Lyle Lanier belongs to someone that would seem to be very remote to our personal experience. But I think the words would seem are the most significant words in this last sentence. Based on what I've heard over the years and what I've read recently, in reality, Lyle Lanier uh, is someone who has a, a very close and personal presence to all of us in psychology, because by all accounts, it is to him that we owe much of what we love and respect about our department. Lyle Lanier was invited in 1950 to head psychology at Illinois after a distinguished career at NYU Vanderbilt and Vassar. He brought with him what was at that time, uh, during the dark days of behaviorism, <laughs> an unusually broad perspective of what a first class psychology department would be like. It was under his leadership that the department recruited the excellent faculty that established here one of the best departments in the country. It was also his vision that created the atmosphere and the environment that have allowed us to maintain that tradition ever since. Those of us who have lived or are living our professional lives in the psychology department ought to know that it is to Lyle Lanier that we owe the serious commitment to a very broad conception of psychology that encompasses very basic research on the one hand with a deep commitment to placing psychology in the public service in any way it can be made to help on the other. It is to him and to his background in quantitative psychology that we owe the weight we place on measurement. And most importantly, it is to Lyle Lanier that we owe the tradition of civility and collegiality which keeps so many of us here in the cornfields despite the shadow of tornadoes and ice storms. Lyle Lanier served as department head for eight years, then became dean of LAS and ultimately provost of the university before retiring in 1972. Thus, his breadth of vision and commitment to excellence reached far beyond the Department of Psychology to shape the campus at large. It is in honor of his many contributions that we have organized this lecture series, which the children of Lyle Lanier have endowed in his name as a token of their affection and appreciation for their father. The Lanier Lecture provides an occasion on which we can present to our colleagues across the campus examples of the manner in which the scientific approach to the analysis of the mind and of behavior can yield results which are of significance across the gamut of human concerns. The broad interest in this series and in this evening's lecture are manifested by the long list of sponsors which include the uh, Beckman Institute, the uh, College of Medicine, the Counseling Center, the Departments of Educational Psychology, Entomology, Molecular and Integrative Physiology, Political Science, and Sociology, 
The Graduate School of Library and Information Science, the Institute for Genomic Biology, the Neuroscience Program, the Roy J. Carver Biotechnology Center, the School of Molecular and Cellular Biology, and the School of Social Work. Without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to my colleague, Professor Brent Roberts, who will introduce Professor Caspi, our speaker for this evening. I am very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Absalom Caspi tonight. Um, Dr. Caspi received his doctorate from the University of Cornell, or Cornell University, in 1986. He's worked at some of the more esteemed universities that we know of, of course, Harvard, um, also uh, Wisconsin University, and King's College in London. Um, uh, he is currently a professor of personality development at King's College and at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I've either known of or known Dr. Caspi for 16 years. Um, as a graduate student, when I first came across his writings on personality development, I have to admit, I, I immediately wanted to be Absalom Caspi. <laughs> he was my Michael Jordan. Um, <laughs> here was a person who wrote fluid, insightful, theoretical and empirical papers on topics which I deeply cared about. As fate would have it, I soon abandoned my nascent desire to be Absalom Caspi because it became clear to me that there were too many Absaloms to aspire to be. For example, you probably know of his recent research in which he's made some amazing groundbreaking um, results or found groundbreaking results in the gene by environment interactions, which he'll talk about tonight. Or you might know about his many awards. So he's won the Early Career Award for Scientific Contribution from the American Psychological Association, sometimes considered one of the best awards you can get from APA. Or you might, of course, um, have come across his uh, publication record, which now exceeds over 200 publications. Um, as an aside, uh, criminologists often report that uh, delinquents, there's a certain category of delinquents, 5% of them are responsible for 50% of the crime. Um, <laughs> seems that good academics are like successful delinquents. <laughs> some deans might agree that some ac successful academics are delinquents, but mm, that being said, I think the analogy works for academics too. There's a small percentage of academics who are responsible for the majority of the scientific research out there. Dr. Caspi is, I believe, leading the way in that category. Um, what you probably don't know about Dr. Caspi are the numerous distinctly different fields of study which he's, he's made major contributions. As I noted, he's been one of the major, major or leading characters in personality psychology. He's also a leading researcher in developmental psychology. He's a leading scholar in sociology, criminology. Um, he's made contributions to clinical psychology um, and health psychology in addition to the work he's done in behavior and molecular genetics. Um, to aspire to be Absalom Caspi is to aspire to be many things. The one way that I still hope to be like Absalom is reflected in his generosity. He's gone out of his way to foster and support my career and the careers of many of my peers. Um, we're all grateful for this guidance and support and hope one day to do the same for a new generation of psychologists. We're pleased and grateful to have Professor Caspi, all of him, here tonight as our Lanier and Millercom lecturer. Please help me welcome Dr. Caspi. I've had a terrific day today. Uh, the, the real highlight uh, of, of, of my visit, aside from meeting Brent and Teresa's daughters last night for dinner, uh, but the real highlight of the visit thus far has uh, been a visit to the Morrow Plots. And I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but this is the home of gene environment interactions. Uh, so, so I was actually very moved by this uh, this, 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 this afternoon, and, and it seems very fitting to be able to talk about gene-environment interactions um, uh, at Illinois. Um, my, my focus this evening is, is going to be on the study of gene-environment inter interactions and how these shape psychiatric outcomes. Uh, and what I would like to do in my presentation is cover um, three topics. Um, but first, let's define a gene-environment interaction and, and specifically what I mean by this. Uh, a gene-environment interaction, which I'll denote as G by E, uh, occurs whenever the effect of exposure to an environmental pathogen on health 
is conditional on a person's genotype, or conversely, when an environmental experience moderates um, uh, genes' effects on health. And um, using that as our starting point, what I'll do is uh, cover three topics. First, I'll review some emerging evidence of gene-environment interactions in psychiatric um, uh, disorders. Second, I'll then step back to discuss a program of research on uh, gene-environment um, uh, interactions, and this is where I'll spend most of the time outlining how it is that we've been going about doing some of our work. Uh, and then I'll turn to discuss some of the implications and future directions um, uh, 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 for research on gene environment interaction. So that's, that's what you have um, uh, in store. Now, over the past uh, few years, our research team has reported the involvement of gene environment inter interactions in, in three different psychiatric disorders. Uh, in our first study, we hypothesized that a functional polymorphism in the promoter region of the gene encoding uh, the neurotransmitter metabolizing enzyme uh, monoamine oxidase a, MAOA, would moderate the effect of childhood maltreatment in the cycle of violence. And what the results here showed was that maltreated children whose genotype conferred low levels of MAOA expression, these are children in uh, red, more often developed conduct disorder following maltreatment than did children whose genotype conferred high levels of MAOA expression. These are the children in yellow. And this was evidence of uh, a genetic moderation of an environmental effect. In a second study, we hypothesized that a functional polymorphism in the promoter region, again, of the serotonin transporter gene would moderate the influence of stressful life events on depression. And here the results showed that individuals with one or with two copies of uh, the short allele, these would be the people in um, yellow and the people in red, exhibited more depression following stressful life events than did individuals homozygous uh, for the long allele. That is, individuals who had two copies of the long version. And in a third study, we demonstrated that gene environment interactions actually apply to environmental pathogens apart from psychosocial risks by asking why does exposure in, uh, to cannabis uh, lead to psychosis in some uh, 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 cannabis users but not in others. Uh, and here we focus on a functional polymorphism in the catecholamethyltransferase gene, COMT, uh, and we asked uh, if this would moderate the association, right, again, between um, uh, cannabis um, use and psychosis. And here what we found uh, is that uh, cannabis users with two copies of the COMT uh, valine allele, these would be the people in uh, red, were likely to develop schizophreniform disorder, uh, but cannabis use ha had no such adverse influence on uh, methionine uh, allele carriers. Uh, these would be the, the um, people in yellow and green. Now, beyond psychiatric genetics and other branches of medicine, gene environment interactions are, uh, have already been reported and they've already been replicated. So if you look on your left, what you can see here uh, is a dietary fat is associated with uh, a more uh, atherogenic lipid profile here illustrated by uh, elevated uh, plasma triglycerides. Uh, but note that this effect of dietary fat on uh, triglyceride is really confined to carriers of a specific allele on the APOA5 uh, gene. Or as another example, if you um, look over on your right-hand side, what you'll see is that heavy tobacco smokers developed gum disease. Uh, here, this is indexed by uh, the number of remaining teeth. I think those of us in psychology and psychiatry would, would do anything to have such concrete variables. You know? <laughs> uh, but, but note that this, this effect was, 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 was primarily confined to people who uh, were carrying a particular variant on the inter uh, leukin-1 gene. Okay. Now, it's these emerging examples of gene-environment interactions that are prompting a lot of interest among behavioral scientists in the phenomenon. Uh, some uh, believe that gene environment, um, that the identification of gene-environment interactions is going to be one of the most important future goals of genetic epidemiology, uh, but others think that this is, in fact, a premature aspiration um, and that gene-environment interactions are, in fact, likely to remain a 
uh, conceptual framework for health research rather than a, a practical goal for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the current high level of curiosity about gene environment interactions is also accompanied by a lot of uncertainty about the feasibility of doing research like this and also uh, by pragmatic questions about how does one go about um, uh, doing it. Um, so what I'd like to do is turn to share with you our strategy for carrying out uh, theory-driven tests of gene-environment um, interactions. And specifically, I want to take you through some uh, 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 of, of the steps involved in the work um, to show you sort of how we've gotten where we are. Um, the starting point for our work is the environment. And I start here not because I'm not a geneticist, uh, and I'm not a geneticist. Mm -hmm. Uh, but because after 50 years of research, behavioral scientists actually know a great deal about which are the most important uh, or potent environmental risk factors for mental disorders. There is a pool of uh, candidate, uh, if you will, environmental risk factors for uh, antisocial disorders, for depression, uh, for uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders. The pool of uh, environmental, candidate environmental risks for some uh, psychiatric conditions such as autism and ADHD uh, is more limited, but there are undoubtedly some such factors operating given that the concordance of genetically identical, that is monozygotic, uh, twins for these highly heritable disorders is less than um, uh, perfect. Um, it's also important to bear in mind that conceptualizing environmental um, risks for mental disorders need not be restricted uh, to psychosocial experiences, uh, but rather should also extend to uh, perinatal, uh, to infectious, and to toxic pathogens uh, that we know are associated with elevated rates of mental disorder. But the question remains, if there are in fact so many environmental risks out there to study, which ones should we focus on if we're interested in the study of the genetic moderation of those environmental risks? And what I want to do is just outline a few considerations. One feature of a good environmental candidate for inclusion in gene environment interactions is, is obvious, but nevertheless bears um, uh, noting, which is that it should not perfectly predict the disorder in question. That is, there should be market variability in response among people exposed to a particular environmental risk. So let's look at this slide. Uh, this is the base rate of conduct disorder in our longitudinal study where we uh, first reported a gene environment interaction. The base rate of um, uh, conduct disorder in our cohort of 1,000 individuals we were studying was about 20%. Among those children who were exposed to maltreatment in our um, cohort, the rate of conduct disorder was close to 50%. But the important point here to note is that half of maltreated children did not develop conduct disorder. Likewise, the um, base rate of depression in our study was 16%, but among those exposed to multiple stressful life events, uh, the depression rate was um, nearly um, um, uh, one-third, 32% of individuals developed depression following multiple stressful life events. But the important point to note is that two-thirds of people who experienced a lot of stress never became depressed. And finally, if we turn to um, our cannabis example, the base rate of schizophreniform disorder in our cohort um, was 3% among um, um, adolescent onset cannabis users. It was uh, 8%, but note that the majority of adolescent onset cannabis users, uh, in fact, did not develop schizophreniform um, or schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Market variability in outcome among people who are exposed to an environmental risk implies that individual differences in genetic susceptibility might be at work. That is, a gene-environment interaction uh, might be operating. Now, once a candidate environmental risk has been identified, we also need to test if that particular risk factor, environmental risk factor, has causal effects that are environmentally mediated. Um, why is this important? Well, um, because it's possible that the putative environmental risk is actually not an environmental risk at all, but is simply a genetic proxy. Um, and and I, let's, let's review with an example. Consider this association between childhood maltreatment and conduct um, disorder. Is this, in fact, an environmentally mediated association, or 
Is it a spurious genetic effect? A spurious genetic effect may come about in two ways. First, it may come about through what we would call a passive gene environment correlation. That is, aggressive parents may transmit an aggressive disposition to their offspring and also maltreat them. Okay? Or it may come about through an active gene environment correlation wherein aggression-prone offspring may well provoke maltreatment by their caregivers. And if an environmental risk is found to be under uh, genetic influence, and if the association between a putative environmental risk and psychopathology is wholly genetically mediated, then a putative gene environment interaction is really, an, is really only an interaction between one specific gene that we happen to have measured and other unidentified genetic factors. Okay. And that could be interesting in its, own right, in its own right, but it would not be a gene environment interaction. Okay. So, what we need to do is if we focus on an environmental risk is establish that it actually has an environmentally mediated effect on behavior. And how can we do this? Well, um, it's the most obvious way to do this is, is unethical, <laughs> uh, which is uh, <laughs> we assign participants to experimental conditions that are expected to induce psychopathology. Um, uh, and you can't do that. Um, but there are at least three methodologies that we can harness um, in an effort uh, to test if a risk factor, um, in fact, has an environmentally mediated influence on behavior. Uh, first, we can uh, demonstrate, seek to demonstrate causation through treatment experiments by showing that an intervention in the environmental risk factor alters the course or reduces the prevalence of a disorder. Okay? So treatment experiments, in fact, rule out genetic influences on the environmental risk factor by randomly assigning subjects to treatment conditions. Um, second, causation can also um, be documented by capitalizing on naturally occurring experiments of nature. So for instance, um, here the longitudinal method uh, can be used to show that the experience of some environmental uh, factor brings about a change in behavior from prior baseline within individuals. And what natural experiments do is they rule out genetic influences on the environmental risk factor by using subjects as their own controls. I mean, what better genetic control than yourself at an earlier time, right? And third, causation can be uh, documented by using twin and adoption designs, paradoxically, to, in fact, control and rule out genetic influences on uh, um, uh, the phenotype while highlighting, really, in bar relief, the influence of uh, a measured environmental variable. And, 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 and I want to turn again to this gene-environment interaction uh, of MAOA and maltreatment. The question is, does maltreatment have an environmentally mediated effect on conduct disorder, or is maltreatment simply a proxy for some genetic risk? Um, and one way to answer this question is to study maltreatment in the context of a twin design. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, what um, uh, we've done in uh, the environmental risk study, uh, which is a longitudinal study of twins where we follow a nationally representative sample of uh, about 1,100 families across the first decade of children's lives in the UK. And in this study, we asked whether the experience of maltreatment is influenced by children's genetic makeup. Um, and when a putative uh, measure of the environment, like the experience of maltreatment, is assessed separately for each child in a twin pair, what one can actually do is test, sounds funny, but you can test the heritability of the environmental risk using the same statistical tools of quantitative genetics that one would apply to any other um, phenotype. The idea here is that if monozygotic twins who are genetically identical are more likely to be uh, uh, concordant for the experience of maltreatment than our dizygotic twins who on average share 50% of their genetic sequence um, uh, in common, this would suggest that some genetic influence uh, is operating on being exposed to um, uh, maltreatment. That is, it would suggest that heritable characteristics of the child influence the child's exposure to maltreatment. Uh, in fact, from our work, there's very little indication that monozygotic twins' greater genetic similarity made them more concordant for the exposure to maltreatment. So when one twin had been maltreated, um, the other twin had also been maltreated in 66% of the cases among monozygotic twin pairs and in 60% of the cases among dizygotic twin pairs. And model fitting here would show you um, that, in fact, there's very little genetic variation in the experience of maltreatment. 
um, uh, it is not accounted for by genetic factors. Uh, and in fact, we go on further with this work, um, what we were able to show not only is that a child's risk for maltreatment was not influenced by children's genes, um, uh, but also that maltreatment experience was followed by an increase in new conduct disorder symptoms, controlling for the child's prior baseline uh, 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 of symptoms, and maltreatment still predicted conduct disorder significantly even when we controlled for the parents' um, uh, antisocial behavior, that is, for, for the familial liability of antisocial behavior. And it's this type of work that, in fact, I think helps, well, helps to support the hypothesis that maltreatment is an environmental uh, risk variable, and it's a critical prelude to establishing that the putative environmental risk may well be a true environmental risk, not simply a proxy for unobserved genetic heterogeneity. Now, a third consideration in how to select an environmental risk is that it should have an effect on biological systems that are involved in the disorder under consideration. Um, this is a bit harder, so I want to review this claim. Genes that influence human behavior must logically exert their effects um, in the brain at the level of neuronal functioning. And it follows that genes that moderate right, the influence of environmental pathogens on human behavior may do so by influencing the neurobiological response to the environmental risk and as such to be a good candidate for um, interaction with genes, an environmental risk ought to have evidence that it affects a neurobiological pathway to disorder. Now, this kind of evidence is highly desirable for framing uh, hypotheses about gene-environment interactions, but it's actually not easily achievable at the moment because, in fact, we know so little about Im the impact of environmental factors on biological um, um, uh, brain systems in many areas of research. It's not true in other, in, in some areas of research. So for example, consider the earlier study I showed you about dietary fat, right? Dietary fat is an ideal environmental candidate for studies of gene environment or gene diet interactions because we know how it contributes to disease, right? Specifically, the pathophysiology of how dietary fat is metabolized by the liver is well enough understood to incorporate the, um, uh, 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 to afford incorporation of, of lipid-related genes into studies of gene-environment interactions that are involved in dyslipidemia. Um, in contrast, the behavioral sciences, in the behavioral sciences, we're only beginning, beginning to have an understanding of some of the pathophysiological processes that convert environmental pathogens, including psychosocial uh, stress, uh, into uh, mental disorders, and this is to remind us about psychosocial stress, a nice little schematic from some of Robert Sapolsky's um, 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 uh, work. Uh, but the model of logic can be followed, nevertheless, to, to at least develop hypotheses about gene-environment interactions that are at minimum, if perhaps flimsily, uh, um, uh, biologically plausible. So, for example, childhood maltreatment was a good environmental candidate for our study of conduct disorder because childhood maltreatment is known to produce persistent alterations uh, in norepinephrine, serotonin, and, and, and dopamine neurotransmitter systems in ways that we know can last into adulthood and influence adult behaviors. And we know that the MAOA enzyme is involved in the metabolism of these neurotransmitters. Um, likewise, cannabis, uh, these are some dopamine, uh, schematic dopamine pathways, but cannabis is a good environmental candidate for our, was a good candidate for, for our study of psychosis because cannabis affects the same neuroanatomical sites and dopaminergic indicators that have been implicated in studies of COMT functionality uh, in schizophrenia. Specifically, we know that cannabis is associated with deficits in dopamine-mediated prefrontal cognitive functions like um, uh, memory and attention, and also with increased mesolimbic uh, dopamine transmi transmission, a mechanism that's, that's been implicated in um, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, hallucinations and delusions. Now, presuming that a putative environmental risk can be shown to be a true and also a biologically plausible environmental pathogen, which is asking for quite a lot. Um, the researcher who's interested in uh, gene-environment interactions now has to measure the environment. Um, many geneticists are put off by measuring the environment because they think it's very expensive and um, to collect environmental data. Uh, and they're right. 
Um, but it's important to remember that measuring environmental pathogens uh, precisely and reliably can also enhance our power to detect gene-environment interactions. Uh, in fact, the sample size that's needed to detect an interaction depends on many um, elements, but one underappreciated consideration is that power depends on measurement reliability. So as you can see in this um, slide, the sample size requirements for detecting uh, a small gene environment interactions vary as a function of how well the outcome measure um, uh, is measured, that is the reliability of the outcome, but also as a function of how well the environmental measure, the environmental uh, exposure uh, is assessed. And in fact, with reliable uh, measurement, the sample size required to detect a small gene environment interaction goes down from 85,000 participants, which would be a big study, to 2,000 participants, uh, which is something that is perhaps a bit more tractable. And as such, while measuring environmental exposures might seem very costly, if you're going, going to do sort of a cost analysis as, as you're thinking about this kind of work, uh, bear in mind that doing it well can actually pay for itself uh, by substantially reducing the need for extremely large uh, samples. Um, so how do we actually do environmental assessments? Well, uh, well, there are many things that one could say about it, but I, uh, but I want to offer um, um, two considerations um, for improved environmental measurement in the context of research on gene environment interactions. First, we need to differentiate between uh, distal versus proximal risk factors. More specifically, we need to understand how the environment that's external to the person gets under the skin and into the brain. And some may find the argument that we actually need to psychobiologize the environment a bit too reductionistic for their taste, but I actually think it's essential for gene environment interactions. A distal risk factor like low socioeconomic uh, status uh, is only important for research on gene environment interactions because it increases the likelihood of the occurrence of some proximal risk. And proximal environmental risk factors are more relevant for research on gene environment interactions because they're likely to meet criteria for pathogen status and thus lend themselves uh, to hypotheses about their impact on specific neurobiological systems which may later mediate psychiatric symptoms. Distal factors don't. Second, it's also critical to take developmental considerations into um, account when interpreting environmental effects because the impact of specific environmental influences is going to be uh, differentially salient at different ages. Um, and moreover, we know that some environmental pathogen effects may be limited to sensitive periods of genetically influenced vulnerability. So here, for example, um, animal research um, shows that pubertal, um, this would be on your left, but not adult, which is on your right, uh, cannabis treatment impairs performance on a variety of cognitive tasks uh, that are among the endophenotypes uh, uh, of schizophrenia, like the startle response and impaired memory. This is work in rats, and it shows uh, an interesting developmental effect of cannabis treatment. And it happens to be uh, uh, in adolescence, but not in adulthood. And it was this work that actually gave us the idea to distinguish in our human research between adolescent onset versus adult onset cannabis uh, use. And in fact, what we found is that adolescent onset cannabis use on your left, you've seen this part of the slide before, had a significant effect on developing psychosis, but only among carriers of the uh, COMT uh, homozygotes for the COMT valine allele. But if you look on your right, what you will see is that there was no association between adult onset cannabis use and psychosis, and there was no interaction between uh, the uh, cannabis use and the COMT genotype. Okay, so what we have to do is actually take developmental considerations on board when we decide which environmental risks to um, uh, focus on. And in fact, you know, some other disorders have a succession of environmental uh, factors, each that are relevant at different uh, stages of the life course. For example, for schizophrenia, uh, we know that infectious exposure is relevant prenatally, uh, hypoxia is relevant at birth, uh, drug use is relevant during early adolescence, uh, and demanding life stress can precipitate adult deterioration. Different environmental risk factors operate at different points in the lifespan. Uh, and clearly whether a particular environmental risk is suitable for a study of gene environment interaction has to be informed by developmental considerations. Now, 
The next challenge, if you have an, a good environmental risk factor to, to study, is how to select a candidate susceptibility gene. And with thousands to choose from, the obvious challenge for testing hypotheses about gene-environment interactions is how to choose which gene to test. And in this regard, there are two considerations. First, if the gene has already been shown to have a replicated main effect, that is a replicated association with a psychiatric disorder, it's an easy target. But it's vital to appreciate that research on gene-environment interactions actually can't rely on this consideration alone because of a paradox. If a gene's effects are conditional on the environment, right, then it's going to have the natural consequence of diminishing the capacity to detect a main effect association between the gene and a disorder. And such the presence of a genetic main effect can nominate a gene for inclusion in research on gene-environment interaction, but the absence of a main effect can't disqualify the gene for inclusion in research on gene-environment interaction. Um, and, and just as an illustration of this, look at this slide. What you see here is um, the absence of direct gene-to-disorder associations in um, our research, whether it's the MAOA gene in, in conduct disorder, uh, serotonin transporter in depression, COMT in psychosis. But in fact, um, all of these genes appear to be involved in gene environment interactions in our research, but you wouldn't have selected them on the basis of a main effect association. The more important consideration in choosing among candidate genes is to identify those with functional significance in relation to reactivity to um, um, the environmental pathogen. Uh, you know, the point, as I said earlier, is often made that a good candidate, gene, good candidate genes are those whose variants have functional uh, physiological significance in brain systems with known connections to the disorder um, uh, under consideration. Um, and this makes sense for studies that focus on gene genetic main effects, but it's not enough for studies that focus on gene environment interactions. In fact, the soundest basis is evidence that the gene is related to reactivity to the environment. So for example, we elected to focus on the serotonin transporter gene um, um, uh, into life events and depression. We didn't choose it on the basis of, a, of an association between the serotonin transporter um, um, uh, variants in the serotonin transporter gene and depression because there isn't one in the literature. Rather, we chose it because a particular variant had been shown to predict individual differences in neurobiological responsiveness to stress. So for example, um, maybe I'll be here, we knew that serotonin transporter knockout mice compared to controls show exaggerated hormonal responses to stress on um, um, uh, your left with the knockouts in, um, uh, on the side, it's in, in, in red, but there were no genotype differences among non-stressed animals, right? All the bars are the same. Similarly, uh, we knew from research that uh, had been um, uh, going on with uh, rhesus macaques that naturally occurring variation in the transporter, uh, serotonin transporter uh, gene promoter had been shown to influence um, endocrine responses among monkeys who were reared under stress. These would be uh, uh, the monkeys on your left who are reared in peer group conditions, uh, but not among monkeys who were reared uh, with their mothers on the right. And finally, human neuroimaging research provided us with another interesting clue. So it's known that perceptual processing of fearful fa faces engages the amygdala, but what was more remarkable was research that had just uh, taken place at the time that we were um, uh, thinking of, of, of uh, setting out on some of our work, uh, showing that amygdala activation um, uh, in response to fear-provoking stimuli actually varies as a function of the serotonin transporter genotype. And specifically what you can see in the bottom uh, part of the panel is that short allele carriers, right, carriers of the short version of the serotonin um, uh, transporter, uh, uh, this, 
serotonin transporter polymorphism, showed greater amygdala activation in, res uh, 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 in response to fearful uh, stimuli than did uh, long, long homozygotes. Uh, and this was the evidence that suggested to us the hypothesis that the serotonin transporter um, uh, gene variation might, in fact, modulate the effect of life stress um, uh, on depression. And in fact, much more experimental uh, work about genetic effects on reactivity to environmental pathogens is, is, is needed. And it's the results of such reactivity studies um, that are going to provide the evidence base that's needed to nominate candidate genes with which to frame sound hypotheses about gene environment interactions. Okay. How do you test for an interaction? You know, there's been much more written about how to study gene environment interactions than there actually have been studies of gene environment interaction, which is kind of, I don't know if it's sad, but it is true. Um, I'm not going to review all these claims um, and counterclaims about what's the best way to do it, but, but I wanted to make a couple of observations. First of all, despite the availability of lots of alternative shortcut designs, the most informative design for testing gene environment interaction is a cohort design um, in which you represent as accurately as possible population variation in the genotype and the environmental exposure and the disorder among healthy controls. Ideally, what you'd like to do is um, 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 uh, enlist the cohort prospectively, follow the cohort longitudinally, so you can repeatedly assess the exposure and the disorder, uh, and you can ascertain the relative timing of uh, the exposure um, uh, um, uh, in relation to, to the disorder. Um, the epidemiological design is also uh, necessary if you're going to be thinking about clinical utility, which hopefully we will be able to start thinking about down the road, uh, because this is going to allow for the accurate estimation of uh, sensitivity, specificity, um, um, and allow us to assess attributable risk. Um, as an example, Let's go back to the cannabis um, uh, illustration. The prevalence of schizophrenia spectrum, dis, uh, uh, schizophrenia spectrum psychosis was 3% in our cohort. Uh, in adolescent onset cannabis use, this risk increased to 8%. Uh, and in adolescent onset cannabis users who were homozygous for the CONT valine allele, this risk increased to 15%. This yields a significant gene environment interaction, but that's not my point. My point is that 85% of CUMT um, uh, uh, of, of, of homozygotes for the VAL allele who smoked cannabis for lengthy periods of time in their adolescence did not develop anything resembling a symptom of psychosis. Um, so, you know, testing for this gene environment interaction basically reveals the clinical applications of this finding are meaningless. You know, you wouldn't want to go out and actually start pre-testing all your pre-pubertal adolescents to see if you should allow them to smoke cannabis or not. That is not the public health implication of this finding. There is no public health implication of this finding, in fact. Um, uh, it's only interesting for revealing etiological uh, processes about how cannabis may exert its effects on the brain. Um, but rather than talk about all the, you know, the, the utility of cohort designs, I want to turn actually to a research design that um, is seldom used, but I think is the most informative research design that we should be using. Uh, and this design is the exposure design. And it involves sampling individuals on the basis of their exposure to an environmental pathogen and then testing whether genotype um, uh, risk individuals develop a disorder, whereas genotype controls um, uh, do not after they've been exposed. And this design answers most directly the question we're interested in answering, which is why is it that some individuals who are exposed to an environmental pathogen become ill and others do not? Okay. So in fact, where, whereas um, uh, uh, the fruit fly, Drosophila, is the insect that's favored by geneticists, uh, researchers who are interested in gene environment interactions may want to pay more attention to the mosquito. Um, and, and in fact, Terry Moffat and I um, became interested and started thinking about research on gene environment interactions when we've traveled in malarial zones. Everyone is bitten by mosquitoes, but not all individuals become ill. Why? Can the answer be found in genetic differences of the DNA sequence level that will help to, influence, to, to explain malarial susceptibility? 
Uh, you wouldn't try to answer this question in Sweden where no one is exposed, right? Uh, rather, what you do is you would choose to study it in exposed populations. Um, Terry um, and, and, and I are a couple, so it's, it's, I, I don't recommend traveling to foreign places you know, with collaborators to get ideas. Um, so we do this for other reasons, but um, anyway. Uh, but, but a good illustration of all this, um, uh, of, of this idea actually comes from, uh, of exposure design, comes from infectious uh, uh, disease research. So uh, as an illustration, uh, Cot and, and colleagues here studied patients who were exposed to streptococcal infection. Okay? Uh, and what they found is that genetic variations in the human leukocyte antigen region explained which patients uh, might develop severe toxic syndrome, and uh, which uh, would develop more minor ailments. And some HLA haplotypes conferred protection from severe uh, systemic disease, and some uh, haplotypes um, uh, conferred risk for uh, disease. And this is the essence of the concept of a gene-environment interaction, and it doesn't require selecting a sample with variation on the environmental um, exposure, but rather it involves selecting people who have been exposed to a pathogen. Uh, and this is something that, you know, it, it works in infectious disease and, and I think it will work in psychology and psychiatry as well. Uh, I'm going to skip the next point. I want to move on to replication. Um, as many of you may know, psychiatric genetics is mired in non-replication. Um, that's a quote and it's a quote from Thomas Insel. And when the head of NIMH says something like that about your field of research, you know, most of us listen up um, uh, and try to do something about it. Um, and Insel is, of course, right. Replication is the sine qua non of, uh, uh, for accepting a hypothesis. Um, here's a little box score that, that I keep on, on, on um, sort of my desk, really, um, uh, of, about our initial reports. Um, and it, it keeps changing, so it's, it's not a very precise account of the research literature. Uh, this next slide shows you the results of a more formal uh, meta-analysis, uh, pulling results from available studies of the MAOA by maltreatment interaction. Uh, so for each study here, we've plotted the effect sizes of the association between childhood maltreatment and antisocial outcomes. Uh, the overall correlation is shown um, uh, of the association um, is, is shown by the, uh, it's the dashed vertical um, uh, line here, uh, but what you can see is that this average correlation conceals actually two distinct patterns of findings. If you look at the top panel, that's the uh, correlation between maltreatment and antisocial outcomes among individuals with a low MAOA activity genotype. If you look in the bottom panel, that's the association between maltreatment and antisocial behavior um, uh, in individuals with a high MAOA activity genotype. And if you actually um, uh, evaluate the correlations, compare the correlations in the two panels, uh, what we learn is that in fact it's significantly higher among low MAOA activity genotype individuals than among high MAOA activity genotypes. Uh, this is exciting. I mean, this is this is looking at this point, and it, it is a rapidly changing field, but at this point, it's looking at least to be a somewhat robust um, association. And you know, there, if, if there are meta-analysis aficionados out there, and I'm, I, there are in every audience, um, <laughs> right? Uh, you can also take out the first study, the CASPI study, um, and, and, and you still observe significant genotype differences uh, here. So this isn't weighted just by, it's not a first study phenomenon. Uh, replication is awfully encouraging, uh, but beyond replication, we also need to do something different. Uh, we need to begin building a nomological network around gene-environment interactions. That is, we actually need to start constructing a series of tests um, uh, 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 and making a series of predictions that will increasingly lead to a better understanding of what the gene-environment interaction may mean. Uh, so, for example, the 2002 um, finding uh, that maltreatment interacts with uh, MAOA genotype to predict antisocial behavior actually has served as the starting point for neuroimaging um, uh, research seeking to test both structural and functional uh, differences between genotypes. Uh, so this team at NIH, led by Meyer Lindenberg, asked whether the low expression variant of um, uh, the MAOA uh, gene actually predicts differences in the size of limbic structures. And what they found first uh, that was interesting is that individuals with a low activity variant of the MAOA genotype actually showed reductions in, in the cingulate cortex and the amygdala. 
Um, but what they also asked was how these structures uh, worked using two different fMRI paradigms. Uh, so for example, when subjects um, were exposed to a facial expression matching task, where they matched uh, emotionally evocative pictures of uh, anger and, 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 and fearful faces, what they found is that low activity carriers uh, showed higher activity and, and forgive this, but, but, but let's call it the uh, uh, a fear hub, right? The amygdala. And when subjects performed an emotion memory task, uh, when asked to encode and recall aversive stimuli uh, or aversive information, uh, they found that low activity carriers had increased reactivity in the amygdala, but also interestingly um, uh, in the hippocampus. So this is, this is so if, if you will, both sort of fear and, and, and kind of memory uh, hubs. So this is the beginning, and, and, and recall that much as we'd like to think that, that, that there are definitive studies in our field, there aren't. Um, in our branch of research, there are no definitive studies. But cumulatively, we may be able to begin to develop and to tighten nomological networks. We do this in psychological testing, and there is no reason why we can't apply the same principle to the study of uh, uh, nature-nurture interplay and specific gene-environment interactions in psychopathology. And this is going to happen not only through straight replications or duplications, but it's also, and in particular, it will need to happen through convergent epidemiological and uh, neuroscience approaches and findings. Study of gene environment interactions, um, I, I hope you appreciate this, is, is in very, very early stages. Um, I've outlined some of the steps that we have tried to deliberately go through in, in plotting and carrying out the work. Uh, what I'd like to do now is actually turn to speculate about the promises of this research about gene environment interactions and to suggest some directions that we might follow. Um, first, for neuroscience. Um, in a nutshell, what we've done is we've gone from searching for direct gene to disorder associations that are here depicted in the top panel, panel A, uh, to asking how do genes modify our responses to environmental pathogens. And this is depicted in the middle um, uh, panel. It's the interaction. But once a gene environment interaction actually is documented to be robust, what this new knowledge should also do is it should stimulate fresh research into the mechanisms behind how the gene environment interaction may work. Um, and here, what we need to really be doing is working towards this bottom um, uh, uh, panel. You know, the very special gift of a reliable gene environment interaction is evidence that there must be a pathway of causal process that connects the three disparate um, uh, endpoints, if you will, of a triangle, okay, of a pathogen, of um, um, a, a gene, and a disorder. And now what we need to do is kind of uh, fill in this, this, this triangle, this triad. Uh, and you know, as I said earlier, one of the major gaps um, in knowledge in the study of mental disorder concerns how an environmental pathogen that's external to the person gets under um, the skin uh, into the brain uh, and uh, 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 leading to a mental disorder. And the insight that this process depends on a person's genotype with respect to a specific functional gene offers clues to unraveling the pathway um, in the laboratory. Uh, and in fact, the most exciting work about gene environment interactions aren't going to come out of epidemiology. I, I to go back to Brent's introduction, I sometimes pretend that I actually know epidemiology. Uh, but, but the important work is not going to come out of epidemiology. I think the more important work is going to come out of neuroscience and out of experimental psychopathology. Um, what we can do in the lab, which we can't do in the field, huh, is we can randomly assign different genotypes to exposures. You know, I can't assign children to maltreatment. Uh, but, but, but we can actually come up with experiments where we assign people uh, to diff different genotypes to different exposures. We can manipulate exposures. That is, we can manipulate the strength of exposure. I can't force you to smoke a set amount of you know, uh, uh, cannabis unless perhaps, uh, if I administer it experimentally, we'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> and, and we can also uh, 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 measure reactivity to exposures um, um, uh, directly. And what such gene environment experiments 
uh, interaction experiments can do is they can use endocrinological measures, peripheral psychophysiological measures, uh, and also neuropsychological measures to index pathogen reactivity. So let's go back to this thing about um, uh, uh, cannabis. Um, We've seen this already a couple of times, right? In our epidemiological study, what we did was we traced the cohort from prior to the onset of cannabis, starting in childhood, um, through the peak risk period of psychosis into their late 20s. And what we found is that carriers of the high activity um, uh, homozygote for, for the valine allele showed subsequent increased risk of psychotic symptoms and psychosis spectrum disorder if they used cannabis. And cannabis use didn't have an adverse effect on methionine carriers. But do you really believe this finding? Um, is the quantification of drug exposure using the self-reports of adolescent subjects sufficient? Hmm? Um, is it possible that valine allele carriers who used cannabis are unusual in some way that we fail to measure? Who knows? And, and how does the valine allele influence susceptibility to cannabis that may lead to um, um, uh, psychosis. Um, well, this is exactly what researchers um, at the University of uh, Maastricht in uh, the Netherlands have asked. Um, what the Dutch researchers did was they used an experimental design to extend um, um, this finding. In their subjects, uh, in their studies rather, what the subjects did was they tested, um, they tested sub the experimenters tested subjects on two occasions. Um, separated by one week uh, as part of a double-blind uh, uh, placebo-controlled crossover uh, design. And in randomized order, the subjects either received THC uh, or a placebo. And what the researchers then did was they measured cognitive functioning and state psychosis in their subjects. And what's very neat is that the results showed that cannabis impaired cognition and increased state psychosis, but this was conditional on COMT genotype. Uh, so this is a, one illustration um, um, uh, uh, of their findings. What you see here is that individuals in the dark uh, purple uh, who carried two copies of uh, the valine allele exhibited more cannabis-induced memory uh, impairments than did carriers of the methionine allele. And this did not happen in the placebo condition. So this is a very nice, tightly done uh, experiment it's interesting because it documents that some of the core neuropsychological features of psychosis spectrum disorders are in fact um, um, uh, 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 affected by the specific gene environment um, uh, interaction. And these findings, I think, uh, sort of the pairing of them together um, serves to illustrate how epidemiology and neuroscience can shape an emerging nomological uh, network. The study of gene-environment interactions also has implications for environmentalists and interventionists. Uh, you know, many environmental researchers, uh, and I number myself among them, uh, have become discouraged in recent years because we've thought that the high estimates of heritability uh, um, uh, mean, or the, the high estimates have been understood to sort of imply that environmental factors uh, are of little importance in the causal origins of mental disorders. Uh, and this is in part the claim, um, I, I, I think you know, when you strip away everything, it's part of the claim of books like The Limits of Family Influence, um, um, uh, The Nurture uh, Assumption, and most recently, uh, 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 the claim in The Blank Slate. Um, in contrast, what gene-environment interactions uh, suggest is that there may in fact be potentiated effects of certain environmental risks in the specific context of uh, 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 genetic vulnerability. Uh, and what such findings about gene-environment interactions uh, do is they help us reframe the scientific question, at least for environmentalists, from is there any environmental risk to who is vulnerable um, uh, to environmental risk. Findings about gene-environment interactions also have implications for the public understanding of genetics. Um, you know, the public's understanding of genetics um, is, is uh, certainly in psychopathology, um, is really very deterministic and also, I think, very fearful. Uh, and findings about gene-environment interactions, I think, can go a long way to help improve the situation. Um, genes are not inevitable causes of diseases, but rather their effects appear to depend on our environments and our experiences. 
And as such, what emerging findings about gene-environment interaction can, can, can do is really help assuage uh, public fears that genetic research is somehow dangerous um, um, research. And, and, and along these lines, I want to offer two clarifications. Um, first, I have not, and, and underscore not here, I have not said that all genetic effects on mental health operate through the environment. Okay? What I've suggested much more modestly is that wherever there's variation among humans in their psychological reactions to a major uh, environmental pathogen for a mental disorder, gene-environment interactions might be operating and are worth exploring. Okay? But that's different than saying that, right, all genetic effects on mental health operate through the environment. Secondly, I've not said that the remarkable capacity, and again, underscore not, I've not said that the remarkable capacity of uh, humans to overcome adversity can be reduced to nothing more than um, uh, base pair differences in DNA. Okay? Um, and, and to just make this point, let's, let's go to the work of um, uh, Joan Kaufman. Um, Joan Kaufman has documented an interesting gene-environment interaction in her work. Uh, specifically, we know that maltreated children on the whole are more likely to develop depression than are non-maltreated children uh, or non-controlled uh, sort of children. But um, what Kaufman's work shows, if you look at the red line, is that you can see that among maltreated children, it is those who carry the short, short version of the serotonin transporter gene who are at greatest risk. This is a gene-environment interaction, right? But, uh, and it's nice because it's actually one of those nice replications um, um, uh, that I was alluding to earlier. But what Kaufman has done is she's taken the work further to document that social support moderates this gene-environment interaction. And specifically among maltreated children, uh, having social support cancels out the risk that is conferred by the short, short genotype. Okay? So it's only among children with low social support that we actually see the stress reactive effects of the short, short genotype on depression. Huh? Uh, and I like this work because, I mean, there are several reasons that I like it, but, but one of the reasons that I like it is that it serves to remind us that gene environment interactions are not, a, are not simply a more subtle uh, kind of form of determinism. Finally, I, I think gene-environment interactions actually have the potential to enhance progress in, in future gene hunting. Uh, you know, one hypothesis is that unrecognized gene-environment interactions may account, at least in part, for the slow progress of research in psychiatric genetics because they make it difficult to detect direct gene-to-disorder associations. Uh, and to appreciate what I mean, consider this uh, uh, slide again. In each of these studies, there were no genetic main effects, that is, genotype was unrelated to outcomes in the, um, 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 uh, in the full sample, uh, but the effects were only revealed among uh, individuals who were exposed to a particular uh, environmental uh, uh, pathogen. And this suggests three implications for research uh, uh, for future gene hunting. Uh, first, candidate gene association studies may not replicate if there are differences uh, on environmental risk exposure between samples. So for example, a sample that has uh, many exposed subjects will report an association, whereas a sample that has no, um, uh, a few exposed subjects will not. And if the exposure is not ascertained, the source of the non-replication is going to remain uh, a mystery to you. Uh, as such, where possible, it's a good idea uh, to measure and take into account a sample's environmental risk exposure. Uh, second, a major cha challenge that comes up in linkage pedigrees is, is sort of thought to be you know, the gene that occasionally skips a generation. So that is a family member carrying a risky, uh, the risky gene uh, appears phenotypically uh, healthy. And what emerging findings about gene environment uh, interaction suggest is that there may be a reason for this. Namely, if the gene's effects are expressed only among family members who are exposed uh, to the environmental risk. Uh, if that's the case, then unexposed carriers uh, might escape disorder. Uh, and as such, it's possible to revive previously unproductive pedigrees to um, uh, see if ascertaining pedigree members' um, uh, environmental pathogen exposure might uh, uh, be, be fruitful. And then there are, of course, uh, genome-wide scans for new disease genes, um, an exciting sort of new um, 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 uh, set of tools uh, and opportunities. Uh, methods and techniques uh, that might be usefully 
um, uh, uh, um, uh, incorporated uh, along with environmental assessments. Uh, the problem is that genome-wide scans, remember, are main effect approaches, and they're going to be inefficient for detecting new disease variants or susceptibility genes when effects are conditional on environmental risk uh, exposure. And such genome-wide um, uh, scans may prove to be much more powerful if gene hunters actually deliberately recruited uh, samples that are selected for a known uh, exposure to uh, uh, um, uh, environmental pathogen. Okay. So my, I guess what I want to leave you on, on, on this score with is that one implication from studies of gene-environment interaction is that candidate gene association studies, linkage uh, 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 studies, genome-wide uh, uh, scans could all enhance potentially their performance by importing environmental data, perhaps to reveal, in fact, larger than expected effect sizes uh, of genes or even to uncover new susceptibility genes for uh, mental disorder. And in a sense, it may very well be that ignoring and nurture may have handicapped our uh, uh, ability to understand and discover nature. Okay. Well, I hope that what I've managed to, to convey uh, uh, is an overview of how we've been going about doing our work. Um, I, I also want to emphasize that I've been using the, the uh, plural we, right? Not, and, and it's not the royal we that I've been using. <laughs> um, um, in large part because this work um, does involve a lot of active and a lot of trusting collaborations between psychologists, psychiatrists, epidemiologists, neuroscientists, and, and geneticists. Um, contrary to what Brent said, none of us can be all of those things. <laughs> um, uh, and doing multidisciplinary work uh, and doing multidisciplinary research involves not only doing the work, uh, but above all else, I think, trying to, to learn, to understand, and to trust um, different scientific cultures uh, and to acquire new languages. Um, so that's, that's my message for this evening. Thank you. Be gentle, it's two, it's 3 a.m. in London, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Twenty-five percent of Caucasians are homozygous for the COMP valine allele. Should we talk drug histories here? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, one of the things, by the way, that's very important to appreciate, and, and I mean, I, I'm sure many of you know this, but, but, but there are huge ethnic differences as well, and that's why I emphasize that it is twenty-five percent of the, you know, of for all intents and purposes, Caucasians, uh, who would be homozygous um, for the Valian allele. Uh, I think if you could go back to your slide with uh, the, the woman who was looking at the high support, the one that made you very uh, pleased is showing support to monitor the, the, uh, the bad effect. Yeah. So, I know what you're going to ask. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, so the conclusion is that, well, okay, we made things better in the SS case, but then it seems like we actually made things worse. Than yeah. Case. I don't know what's going on down in that little <laughs> path. I mean, sorry, we're, we're, we're talking about this funny little um, thing right, um, um, that effect right there. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, how, how much of this is being recorded? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Look, you know, what, what I don't think that there are that many disordinal gene-environment interactions in nature. 
I mean, I think most of the gene-environment interactions we're likely to see are, are you know, ordinal interactions, that is, just differences in, in, in effect size, but not complete switchovers. So I'm not sure what's going on uh, in this particular um, um, uh, uh, example where we see that disordinality um, um, emerging. Um, and, and I think, you know, perhaps an unsatisfying answer, but I think we need to wait to see uh, how uh, the addition of more data, uh, 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 you know, what further um, uh, data will show about this. Um, uh, certainly the, you know, um, this, the, 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 the earlier one is, is actually fairly robust, and it's, it's um, she's actually replicated this in, in two different samples, um, which, which I find very impressive. Am I, am I supposed to point or? Okay. <laughs> is there a Darwinian undercarriage for the types of interactions you're talking about, or are these just bad genes? Do the first part again? Is there a Darwinian undercarriage? Oh, um, no, these are not bad genes. Um, 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 yeah. In fact, you know, it's, it's not really clear to me. Let's take the, the serotonin transporter example. Are we actually seeing um, a particular version conferring risk, or are we seeing a different version conferring protection? You know, uh, and, and I'm not sure which it is. Um, um, and in fact, I have no empirical handle um, on it. Um, you may also wonder why why are these variants still out there? Uh, no doubt because. Uh, in some instances, the long, uh, long um, um, sort of homozygotes are at risk for other um, uh, infect illnesses and conditions. So I, I really tried, despite uh, the very my very loose uh, uh, language this evening, to avoid uh, wishing to speak about this, you know, as risky genes. Um, I think that's a it's a convenient, if uh, unsatisfactory, if not even perhaps inappropriate on my part. So it's potentially acceptable when you look at the analog somehow to develop. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because you're going to figure out, uh, you know, what we need to understand is actually what is going on with the serotonin um, uh, with this particular um, um, VNTR, uh, variable limb tandem repeat, uh, neurobiologically under different contextual conditions. Um. So, so thinking about the method Right. Does the valley change the enzyme activity or perhaps the localization? I'm just trying to think about the mechanism. Right. So um, it, uh, it is associated with about a 40% uh, uh, enzymatic uh, activity difference between the val uh, uh, and met. Uh, so that's one of the things that we know about it. Um, is it, you know, other questions that may come up is, um, is it actually um, the causal uh, variant? Um, uh, there is an interesting um, um, three-SNP haplotype block uh, that has actually been uh, associated with enzymatic activities, leading some people to think that perhaps uh, in some studies, which has been, you know, giving sort of stronger signal than just that SNP, the COMT SNP alone, um, that actually hasn't uh, been as robustly replicated as just the straight SNP, uh, um, at least association. Um, so it may very well be that what we have here is a real causal variant. Um, um, the other question that comes up is, is actually how it affects dopamine in different parts of the brain. Uh, so a lot of uh, the COMT, uh, uh, this particular SNP has been studied a great deal because uh, uh, of its uh, link to um, um, this dopamine activity in the um, prefrontal cortex. Um, I, you know, I doubt that things are that specific. Is that, uh, but um, yeah, there, there's, I mean, we could talk about it later, but, but there's beautiful literature on this particular SNP. It's amazing what you can do with one SNP. <laughs> Um, boy, 
let me let me let me offer two 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 comments in response to that. Uh, is the candidate gene approach the right way to go? Um, no. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, let me just say about all of this work, um, not sort of false humidity, but this is about as primitive as things could be. We have one polymorphism, one environment. Wouldn't it be nice if all of life just sort of, you know, if, if our whole research world just came in such tidy little bundles? Um, um, so no, this is, this is awfully um, uh, primitive, uh, but it's a starting point. Um, whether or not actually um, going the expression route is the right way to go, I'm not sure, uh, primarily because tissue differences really do concern me greatly, um, especially when for, for these kinds of phenotypes that we're um, interested in. Um, uh, but I'm actually going to put my money for gene discovery on exposure designs and, and genome-wide scans for exposure designs. So if, if I had to make, you know, my bet on, on where I'd go for the next five years. It's beautiful to have so many tools where you can all disagree about which one is the right one to use. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, uh, interaction. And these findings, I think, uh, sort of the pairing of them together um, serves to illustrate how epidemiology and neuroscience can shape an emerging nomological uh, network. The study of gene-environment interactions also has implications for environmentalists and interventionists. Uh, you know, many environmental researchers, uh, and I number myself among them, uh, have become discouraged in recent years because we've thought that the high estimates of heritability uh, um, uh, mean, or the, the high estimates have been understood to sort of imply that environmental factors uh, are of little importance in the causal origins of mental disorders. Uh, and this is in part the claim, um, I, I, I think you know, when you strip away everything, it's part of the claim of books like The Limits of Family Influence, um, um, uh, The Nurture uh, Assumption, and most recently uh, 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 the claim in The Blank Slate. Um, in contrast with gene-environment interactions, uh, suggest is that there may in fact be potentiated effects of certain environmental risks in the specific context of uh, 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 genetic vulnerability. Uh, and what such findings about gene environment interactions uh, do is they help us reframe the scientific question, at least for environmentalists, from is there any environmental risk to who is vulnerable um, uh, to environmental Findings about gene-environment interactions also have implications for the public understanding of genetics. Um, you know, the public's understanding of genetics um, is, is uh, certainly in psychopathology, um, is really very deterministic and also, I think, very fearful. Uh, and findings about gene-environment interactions, I think, can go a long way to help improve the situation. Um, Genes are not inevitable causes of diseases, but rather their effects appear to depend on our environments and our experiences. And as such, what emerging findings about gene-environment interactions can, can, can do is really help assuage uh, public fears that genetic research is somehow dangerous um, um, research. And, and, and along these lines, I want to offer two clarifications. Um, first, I have not, and, and underscore not here, I have not said that all genetic effects on mental health operate through the environment. Okay. What I've suggested much more modestly is that wherever there's variation among humans in their psychological reactions to a major uh, environmental pathogen for a mental disorder, gene environment interactions might be operating and are worth exploring. Okay. But that's different than saying that right, all genetic effects on mental health operate through the environment. Secondly, I've not said that the remarkable capacity, and again, underscore not, 
I've not said that the remarkable capacity of uh, humans to overcome adversity can be reduced to nothing more than um, uh, base pair differences in DNA. Okay? Um, and, and to just make this point, let's, let's go to the work of um, uh, Joan Kaufman. Um, Joan Kaufman has documented an interesting gene-environment interaction in her work. Uh, specifically, we know that maltreated children on the whole are more likely to develop depression than our non-maltreated children uh, or non uh, sort of controlled children. But um, what Kaufman's work shows, if you look at the red line, is that you can see that among maltreated children, it is those who carry the short, short version of the serotonin transporter gene who are at greatest risk. This is a gene environment interaction, right? But, uh, and it's nice because it's actually one of those nice replications um, um, uh, that I was alluding to earlier. But what Kaufman has done is she's taken the work further to document that social support moderates this gene environment interaction. And specifically among maltreated children, uh, having social support cancels out the risk that is conferred by the short, short genotype. Okay? So it's only among children with low social support that we actually see the stress reactive effects of the short, short genotype on depression. Huh? Uh, and I like this work because, I mean, there are several reasons that I like it, but, but one of the reasons that I like it is that it serves to remind us that gene environment interactions are not, a, are not simply a more subtle uh, kind of form of determinism. Finally, I, I think gene environment interactions actually have the potential to enhance progress in, in future gene hunting. Uh, you know, one hypothesis is that unrecognized gene environment interactions may account at least in part for the slow progress of research in psychiatric genetics because they make it difficult to detect direct gene to disorder associations. Uh, and to appreciate what I mean, consider this uh, uh, slide again. In each of these studies, there were no genetic main effects that his genotype was unrelated to outcomes in the, um, 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 uh, in the full sample, uh, but the effects were only revealed among uh, individuals who were exposed to a particular uh, environmental uh, uh, pathogen. And this suggests three implications for research uh, uh, for future gene hunting. Uh, first, candidate gene association studies may not replicate if there are differences uh, on environmental risk exposure between samples. So for example, a sample that has uh, many exposed subjects will report an association, whereas a sample that has no, um, uh, a few exposed subjects will not. And if the exposure is not ascertained, the source of the non-replication is going to remain uh, a mystery to you. Uh, as such, where possible, it's a good idea uh, to measure and take into account a sample's environmental risk exposure. Uh, second, a major ch challenge that comes up in linkage pedigrees is, is sort of thought to be you know, the gene that occasionally skips a generation. So that is a family member carrying a risky, uh, the risky gene uh, appears phenotypically uh, healthy. And what emerging findings about gene environment uh, interaction suggest is that there may be a reason for this. Namely, if the gene's effects are expressed only among family members who are exposed uh, to the environmental risk, uh, if that's the case, then unexposed carriers uh, might escape disorder. Uh, and as such, it's possible to revive previously unproductive pedigrees to um, uh, see if ascertaining pedigree members' um, uh, environmental pathogen exposure might uh, uh, be, be fruitful. And then there are, of course, uh, genome-wide scans for new disease genes, um, an exciting sort of new um, 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 uh, set of tools uh, and opportunities. Uh, methods and techniques uh, that might be usefully um, uh, uh, um, uh, incorporated uh, along with environmental assessments. Uh, the problem is that genome-wide scans, remember, are main effect approaches, and they're going to be inefficient for detecting new disease variants or susceptibility genes when effects are conditional on environmental risk uh, exposure. And such genome-wide um, uh, scans may prove to be much more powerful if gene hunters actually deliberately recruited uh, samples that are selected for a known uh, exposure to uh, uh, um, uh, environmental pathogen. Okay. So my, I guess what I want to leave you on, on, on this score with is that one implication from studies of gene environment interaction is that candidate gene association studies, linkage uh, 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 studies, genome-wide uh, uh, scans 
could all enhance potentially their performance by importing environmental data, perhaps to reveal, in fact, larger than expected effect sizes uh, of genes or even to uncover new susceptibility genes for uh, mental disorder. And in a sense, it may very well be that ignoring and nurture may have handicapped our uh, uh, ability to understand and discover nature. Okay. Well, I hope that what I've managed to, to convey uh, uh, is an overview of how we've been going about doing our work. Um, I, I also want to emphasize that I've been using the, the uh, plural we, right? Not, and, and it's not the royal we that I've been using. <laughs> um, um, in large part because this work um, does involve a lot of active and a lot of trusting collaborations between psychologists, psychiatrists, epidemiologists, neuroscientists, and, and geneticists. Um, contrary to what Brent said, none of us can be all of those things. Um, uh, and doing multidisciplinary work, uh, and doing multidisciplinary research involves not only doing the work, uh, but above all else, I think, trying to, to learn, to understand, and to trust um, different scientific cultures uh, and to acquire new languages. Um, so that's, that's my message for this evening. Thank you. Be gentle, it's two, it's 3 a.m. in London, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Twenty-five percent of Caucasians are homozygous for the CONT valine allele. Should we talk drug histories here? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, one of the things, by the way, that's very important to appreciate, and, and I mean, I, I'm sure many of you know this, but, but, but there are huge ethnic differences as well. And that's why I emphasize that it is 25 percent of the, you know, for all intents and purposes, Caucasians uh, who would be homozygous um, for the veiling allele. Uh, if you could go back to your slide with uh, the, the woman who was looking at the high support, the one that made you very uh, pleased that showed the support could monitor the, the, uh, the bad effects. Yeah. So, I know what you're going to ask. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, so the conclusion is that, well, okay, we made things better in the SS case, but then it seems like we actually made things worse. Than yeah. Things. I don't know what's going on down in that little <laughs> path. I mean, sorry, we're, we're, we're talking about this funny little um, thing right, um, um, that effect right there. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, how, how much of this is being recorded? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Look, you know, when, when I don't think that there are that many disordinal gene-environment interactions in nature. I mean, you know, I think most of the gene-environment interactions we're likely to see are, are you know, ordinal interactions. That is, just differences in, in, in effect size, but not complete switchovers. So I'm not sure what's going on uh, in this particular um, um, uh, uh, example where we see that disordinality um, um, emerging. Um, and, and I think, you know, perhaps an unsatisfying answer, but I think we need to wait to see uh, how uh, the addition of more data, uh, 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 you know, what further um, uh, data will show about this. Um, uh, certainly the, you know, um, this, the, 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 the earlier one is, is actually fairly robust, and it's, it's um, she's actually replicated this in, in two different samples, um, which, which I find very impressive.
Am I, am I supposed to point or? Okay. <laughs> Do the first part again. Is there a Darwinian undercurrent? Oh, um, no, these are not bad genes. Um, 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 uh, yeah. In fact, you know, it's, it's not really clear to me. Let's take the, the serotonin transporter example. Are we actually seeing um, a particular version conferring risk, or are we seeing a different version conferring protection? You know? uh, and, and I'm not sure which it is. Um, um, and in fact, I have no empirical handle um, on it. Um, you may also wonder why, why are these variants still out there? Uh, no doubt because uh, in some instances, the long, uh, long um, um, sort of homozygotes are at risk for other um, uh, in fact illnesses and conditions. So I, I really tried, despite uh, the very, my very loose uh, uh, language this evening, to avoid uh, wishing to speak about this, you know, as risky genes. Um, I think that's a, it's a convenient, if uh, unsatisfactory, if not even perhaps inappropriate convention on my part. So it's potentially accessible in the way that the MLI can actually develop. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because you're going to figure out uh, you know, what we need to understand is actually what is going on with the serotonin um, uh, with this particular um, um, VNTR, uh, variable number tandem repeat, uh, neurobiologically under different contextual conditions. Uh. So, so thinking about the methyl transferase, the COMP. Right. Does the valine change the enzyme activity or perhaps the localization? I'm just trying to think about the mechanism. Right. Uh, it is associated with about a 40% uh, uh, enzymatic uh, activity difference between the val uh, uh, val and met. Uh, so that's one of the things that we know about it. Um, is it, you know, other questions that may come up is, um, is it actually um, the causal uh, variant? Um, um, there is an interesting um, um, three SNP haplotype block uh, that has actually been uh, associated with enzymatic activities, leading some people to think that perhaps uh, in some studies, which has been, you know, giving sort of stronger signal than just that SNP, the COMT SNP alone, um, that actually hasn't uh, been as robustly replicated as just the straight SNP, uh, um, at least association. Um, so it may very well be that what we have here is a real causal variant. Um, um, the other questions that comes up is, is actually how it affects dopamine in different parts of the brain. Uh, so a lot of uh, the CMT, uh, uh, this particular SNP has been studied a great deal because uh, uh, of its uh, link to um, um, this dopamine activity in the um, prefrontal cortex. Um, I, you know, I doubt that things are that specific. Is that, um, but. Um, yeah, there, there's, I mean, we could talk about it later, but, but there's beautiful literature on this particular SNP. It's amazing what you can do with one SNP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it seemed like the candidate gene approach is just a very restricted, self-limiting approach to identifying the genetic part of the human body interaction. Um, how about, uh, you know, E2DL and uh, E2DL expression Let me, let, me, let me offer two, two, two comments in response to that. Uh, is the candidate gene approach the right way to go? Um, no. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, let me just say about all of this work, um, not sort of false humidity, but this is about as primitive as things could be. We have one polymorphism, one environment. Wouldn't it be nice if all of life just sort of, you know, if, if our whole research world just came in such tidy little bundles. Um, um, so, no, this is, this is awfully um, uh, primitive, uh, but it's a starting point. 
um, whether or not actually um, going the expression route is the right way to go, I'm not sure, uh, primarily because tissue differences really do concern me greatly, um, especially when for, for these kinds of phenotypes that we're um, interested in. Um, uh, but I'm actually going to put my money for gene discovery on exposure designs and, and genome-wide scans for exposure designs. So if, if I had to make, you know, my bet on, on where I'd go for the next five years. Is that? It's beautiful to have so many tools where you can all disagree about which one is the right one to use. Right. <laughs> <laughs>